So, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here at the New Diagnostic Working Group annual meeting for this union. I am Daniela Ciorillo, the co-chair of the New Diagnostic Working Group. Uh, the first announcement is that Katharina Bohem is not here this year for a fantastic uh, reason. She just had a baby yesterday. So I would like uh, all of you to join me in making the best wish to Katharina and the new Leandra, I think. Uh, is the name correct? So I would like all of you to close at the new baby. Katharina is not a fantastic person, a great CEO for Find, but is also a very good friend. And so I really wish uh, to her and the baby all the best. And uh, the second announcement is that I would like my co-chair for today to introduce himself. He's a new addition, great addition to the Find team. And Bill Rodriguez is going to introduce himself. Uh, good morning, everyone, and, and thanks, Daniela. So the, um, it's hard to follow a, a newborn baby. Um, and it's also hard to follow Katerina. So my name is Bill Rodriguez. Um, I joined FIND approximately three weeks ago as the new chief medical officer. And in Katerina's absence while she's on maternity leave, I'll be filling in for her as well. And so I'll be sitting in as a co-chair for the, for the working group in her absence. And then she'll be back uh, in the, uh, early next year in, in the spring. So it's a pleasure and honor to, to be with you today. I hope to make more substantive uh, comments and contributions over the course of my time at the working group. Today, really, my job is to make sure that we move things through quickly and on time. And uh, in light of that, we'll have a coffee break, which we'll, in we'll introduce, and then we'll ask people to come back in after that um, on time for the next sessions. And the first session will be uh, introduced and moderated by Daniela. So I would like to start by a, a very short introduction of the new diagnostic working group working plan for this year and the next year. As you know, we, are, we have a vision to support the high quality diagnosis and the mission to foster the development and evaluation of the new diagnostic for tuberculosis, to make them available to the majority of people and in particular to support the patients that are suffering for the disease. We are completely uh, in line with the NTB strategy and the goals of the Global Plan to NTB 2016-2020 uh, and, uh, and their objective. And uh, um, we have uh, shifted our activities and tuned them as support, as, uh, as really proposed by the Stop TB Partnership in task forces. So now we are moving our organization um, toward the time-limited task forces. And for the, the next uh, uh, year, and probably two years, we have identified uh, three different task forces. And the first one is the use of the next generation sequencing for detection of drug resistance and correlation of specific mutation with in vitro MICs. And the coordinator of this task force is Stefan Niemann. He, uh, we will have a core group uh, meeting um, tomorrow night, and the objective and the detailed plan will be discussed among the core group uh, of the new diagnostic working group. The second task force is to foster the development and evaluation of the test for progression of latent TBI to active disease, and the coordinator is Alberto Mattelli that was really involved uh, uh, previously in the WHO, and he moved back uh, to the University of Brescia uh, very recently, and uh, he will um, support the priority uh, for, for the task force uh, and make sure that the objective will be reached. The, task, the, the third task force uh, is um, on biomarkers. A lot has been said on biomarkers or biosignature for TB as a point of care test, and the coordinators is Tobias Broger from FIND. The last thing I would like to mention here, I'm sorry, but the order of the slides got confused in the, in the projecting room. 
is that find and the new diagnostic working group has really supported and deeply embedded in the collaborative initiative to develop a centralized global TB drug resistant database. And I would like to mention that to you because I would like to use you as a ambassadors for this initiative toward the rest of the world, in the countries, with the NTPs, with the scientists. Because I really think that the people who will be benefiting from this initiative is uh, uh, really all the group we can think about. Patient, clinician, diagnostic developers, policy makers, drug developers, the vaccine community, and the scientists itself. So really everybody, and only marching together as a single group, joining effort, we can reach the confidence on, in molecular diagnostics to really move ahead and speed up the diagnosis of tuberculosis. And with that, I, I can stop and I will let Bill to introduce the first speaker. We won't be doing a long, belabored introduction, so I um, apologize if you're expecting one, but we're going to start the first session with Derek Crook uh, from the University of Oxford. Please, Derek, come on. Good morning, everyone, and a very special thanks to Daniela and other members of FIND and the new diagnostic working group. We've developed some ideas that I'm going to go through with you that have been incubating for the best part of three years to answer some questions, and I'm going to take you through that. I think it's apposite because we were having discussions with Research TV yesterday asking the question of how you apply a probability to a variant in the genome that is likely or does confer resistance. And that's kind of a statistical question, and I'm going to give you a sense of that. And in developing this, Daniela has been absolutely critical. Stefan, who you just heard mentioned, has also been critical. And Angela has been enormously helpful from the CDC Atlanta. And I can't see everybody else very clearly, but there's a growing number of people that have helped with this effort. The main question is, can all, or a little bit less than all, most genomic variation conferring anti-tuberculosis drug resistance be discovered? That's kind of the question. Because if you can, you solve a lot of problems. Okay, so we know many resistance determinants. Lots of work has been done. Many of you in the audience have worked diligently and, 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 and uh, hard on this question. Us from Oxford are new to this. We have an interest in genome sequencing that we've then applied to this, and have, I'll take you through the approaches we've used. How best to discover more variation? And as I've implied in the sort of Paul mentioned statement, our focus is on whole genome sequencing. And whole genome sequencing, as many of you realize, is at the moment incomplete. We don't reveal the whole genome, but it's getting better. And in the end, can you dispense with phenotyping? In other words, could you use a genomic test that gives you an answer very rapidly? And we can perhaps deal with that in questions if we have time at the, at the end. And more than anything else, you need a knowledge base. In other words, you need to know which variants confer resistance and which don't in order to, to use it effectively. And that's the problem. And to make best use of it, and if you're going to use whole genome sequencing, you need a software. People talk about pipelines. In the end, it's a software. You need to code up a software that extracts the information from whole genome sequencing and presents it in an intuitive and usable form. So that's, those are the things you need. Well, to help us think through this, we started not knowing anything about variants. You guys all know the variants. It's like a bunch of cartoon characters you know. You know every one of them. You can, you know, you can go to a, a, a show and, you know, everybody knows the answers. We didn't. We started from the position we didn't know anything about how the system works. And we derived information starting in an un so-called unbiased way. It wasn't truly unbiased, but it was sort of unbiased. 
and the work was published uh, earlier this year with Stefan and Nazia as well, the co-authors, they kindly donated isolates to our effort. And this gave us an understanding of what we might need to do to recover all the variation. And I'll walk you through it. Okay. So we know, kind of, the assumption bit of this is that there are some 23 or maybe more genes that are involved in conferring resistance. So that's 23. There's some 4,000 others that don't. By the way, the techniques I'm going to describe to you shortly actually can look at the whole genome. That you don't need to restrict them to the genes of interest, as it were. You can, you can do either way. And most of the resistance arises de novo. Not all of it, but most of it arises de novo through a nucleotide substitution that affects coding in some sort of way or function of a gene. It's usually non-synonymous uh, 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 substitutions, but you can get deletions and insertions as, as, as well. The thing about this arising frequently in a non-recombining organism is that you, across the whole family tree of the germ, you get resistance arising independently, and that's called homoplasy. That's a, a, a feature of, of convergent evolution. It's two completely separate sort of families getting the same thing, and you can detect that. You can look for it in a genome using little bits of software, and that's a signal for selection, and selection in this situation is emergence of resistance to the antimicrobial agent. Okay? So what we did, not knowing anything about this, we took some 3,600 isolates and did a derivation set and a validation set. In the derivation set, we didn't know which genes to look for. We asked the question, knowing the DST result and looking at 23 genes, we looked at every variant that was not wild type in those 23 genes and asked, was the, was, was the organism resistant or susceptible? It's just a little rule of thumb that we did, a heuristic approach going through it and derived a, a set of genes in this derivation set of, of 2099. Lined that set up and then did in a validation set, asked again whether those, those variants occurred in a validation set and we got some results that helped us understand where we need to go to answer the question. Okay. So this is looking at the results of the validation set. <coughs> and I'm going to take you through this. Let's leave this to one side, and we don't have that many anti-tuberculosis drugs here. But if you look at all the variants, you get a sensitivity or isoniazid of 85% and a specificity of 98%. Using a knowledge base derived de novo from the derivation set. So we didn't take all the hard work that you've done, we just looked for them. Now, if you in exclude unclassifieds here, and this is really important, because if you have wild type, it's highly predictive of susceptibility. You don't have a variant within those genes, you know that you're going to be susceptible with a very high sensitivity, <coughs> which comes here at 98%, a specificity rather, but 98%. If you if, if you, that's 98% there, sorry. And if you have a variant that you haven't seen before, it wasn't in the set before, you haven't classified it yet, and you know that it might signify resistance or not, so it's unclassified. So if you remove the unclassifieds in that sense, you get a huge sensitivity and specificity for the data that you know. So you, in a sense here that you can build up progressively, just using this heuristic method, greater certainty about whether something is sensitive, something's resistant, and you can get very high certainty around resistance, and you can be certain when you don't know. So you've got three classes. So this was, you can see this working clinically, but it can give you an insight about how you must go. What the next slide shows you is the distribution of, of variants in this histogram here that occur for each drug. So you get isoniazid, rifampicin, ifambutol, and each one of these little labels here is a variant. Okay? The ones in red are in the Hain 
uh, test, so they were well known. So we found out that we found a lot of the Hain uh, uh, resistance conferring uh, mutations. But what was fun, would you all know, we didn't know, no, that some of the variants are highly predictive of resistance. So here in, in black and gray, you know that the variant confers phenotypic resistance. If you come to one of the ethambutol variants, yeah, you all know it well, I don't remember it myself, it's about 50-50 because the red and orange are susceptible. So for that variant, half the time it is susceptible. So you know variants vary in the extent to which they confer resistance. Yeah? What is crucial about this data? If you want to find every variant, you can start to get the feel that you've got to do a lot. And because the phenotype doesn't necessarily correlate that effectively with the genotype, you have to look at more. That's just a general rule of thumb again. So you can start to get a feel, but you've got to look at a lot. Then you look at this histogram. Some have a very popular variant, and some like pyrazinamide don't seem to have popular variants. So for particular drugs, it will vary as to what kind of profile of variants you have. And if you ha don't have popular ones, you realize you're going to go on looking, 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 looking. Just, this is just plain logic. If you go on finding variants forever, some might not be clinically relevant. Even though it encodes resistance, it might be one in a million. Do you want to worry about that? So those are the kinds of concepts you want to be storing up in the back of your mind. So if you look at those 23 genes and look at the occurrence of variation in those 23 genes with every next isolate, you see you're not exhausting the variation. So this is known as a rarefaction curve. It's going on, up, and up, and up. So you get the sense that variation may be, when looking at 3,000, going to go on forever. Or is it? Big question. You need to understand that. And this curve is looking at the actual variance we found. In this side here is in the derivation set, and then we went to the, val to, to the validation set, and you can see that we found a whole lot of var variance in the validation set we hadn't seen before. So as you iterate through this, you're going to find more and more and more. It gives you a sense of it. And some, we're nearly getting all the variation that explains resistance, such as in rifampicin, not too bad in INH, rather poor in pyrazinamide. You all know this. We discovered it without knowing that, starting afresh, to give us an idea of how we would have to, the size of sampling we needed, needed to look at to answer the question. So can we do better? Yes. You've got to look at a lot of strains. A huge number. So we got the number thing. And to have precision about what you're doing, you need better DST. Two simple little requirements, conceptually. In practice, they're really hard concepts. We formed a, col a, 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 a collaboration which has started quite small. We hope it will grow, and it's very much worth finding. We called it cryptic, and I see that Daniela kindly referred to it. And what are we going to do in this Consortium. The first bit is to improve DST if we can. We're not alone in this. Many other people are doing it. And they're taking advantage of the, of the microtata tray and we're optimizing that. And we're working with Thermo Fisher and we've been funded in a, me a sort of mediocre way by the Gates Foundation. Very helpfully and we're moving. And in the Gates Foundation, we're going to accumulate 21,000 genomes and we can have extensive DST in 5,000. We have an application to the Wellcome Trust we're going to defend next week. So it's nice to see you all. There's a lot of interest, so hopefully we'll, we'll get funding from there. And we have commitments to collect another 80,000 genomes with about 37,000 with extensive DST funded through the grant. This potentially will give you at least 100,000, if not in excess of 100,000 genomes and rising 50,000 with extensive DST, and I'll show you the DST. We're in the evolution of designing that. Marco Shito is helping us a lot with that. I'll show you on the next slide. The point about this is that this is going to be powered for the common, uh, 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 commonly used drug, right? Where you have DST for virtually all 100,000. 
to detect 1% of 1%, about 1 in 10,000 variants in that whole study thing. So you're beginning to get huge power. And if it's less than that, you might argue, is it that clinically relevant? Are you going to really worry about that? So this has got good power associated. I'm not going to run through this, but this is an evolution. You lot quarrel about anti-tuberculosis drugs like you can't imagine. I, I, it's absolutely amazing, entertaining, and fantastic. You can't come to a, to a good decision, but we're navigating towards a good decision, which is great. The other fact I didn't mention is the distribution of variants the same in every country, or does it differ? So in the consortium, we've got a lot of countries contributing, and some of them are here. We want more. What are the approaches to analysis? There's a heuristic method I quoted. Then there's statistical genetic approaches based on GRAS that can be modified for, for the, the population structure of TB. And there's machine learning. And you need to store the data, which we're doing with CPTR, through the Resic tb uh, consortium. So it's all set up and ready to go. GRAS, this is a Manhattan plot. Basically, this is an unbiased way. You just essentially do the analysis and find the genes that, that are explanatory for a particular phenotype. And this can be done, and there are about three or four ways of doing this. Uh, this is some work that we've done on the original set, and you find the genes. However, you need to be powered to do it. So you need about 10, 15 variants in the population that you're studying in order to get statistical power. And if you have variation in the penetrance of the gene, in other words, the expression or phenotype, you lose power. So it, it, you've got to, this is, this is quite a stringent test, as it were. And there are various ways of doing it. This is machine learning. These are Bayesian-type curves here. And this says that, that if you've got the CAT-G gene, or no, sorry, the FAB-G1 gene, about 100% of those will be resistant. And configuring the analysis another way, that will account for only about 25% of the resistance. Derek, just give you about one more minute. So what are the outcomes that we're looking for? A probability a variant confers resistance for most clinically used drugs. That's what we're after. The frequency distribution of resistance conferring variants by geography. And we need to assess the clinical impact of very rare variants. Do we really need to know them? Do we need to go on forever or can we sort of give up at some point. And we will learn from this whether there are other non-genetic mechanisms that account for resistance. We will find that out. Lots of people think there's a huge. And we need wider participation. If we get the welcome funding, we're going to seek from the community wider participation in this effort. Thank you very much. Thank you, Derek. Uh, the session is structured in a way that we will have all the questions and the discussion at the end. So I would like to ask the second speaker, that is Angela Stark from the CDC, to come to the podium and she will talk about the RISEC TB initiative and recent progress in the development of data sharing platform. Angela? Good morning. I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak about Resec TB. I feel like part of my presentation has already been given, which is great, because hopefully one of the things that's been reflected is the excitement around this particular initiative. One of the things I hope to do today is to convey to you the enormous amount of work that's been done over the past year by a large group of people that is really focused on a global collaborative effort. So in terms of the talk, this is the outline. I'll give you some information about the purpose and overarching goal. Talk a little bit about the unified analytic pipeline that's been employed as part of this initiative. Um, give you a glance at the Resec TB landing page and then give you a timeline in terms of future implementation. So in terms of the rationale for the database development, um, I think we can all agree there's been great work over the past few years um, in many aspects and learning more about the molecular basis of drug resistance. But just as you heard from Derek's presentation and from Daniela's introduction, we have more work to do. And we've heard as a community an appeal for an accessible, comprehensive, and curated da data platform, one that is globally representative in nature, one that includes a high volume of submissions where we have information about the genetic data, 
the correlated phenotypic data, and optimally information about the clinical outcome or clinical data as well. And so the, this is the, the basis for the initiative. And I'm happy to tell you today, you probably heard a little about, about it last year, but I'm happy to tell you today that it has a name. And the name which you've already heard is Resec TB. And you see in the upper right hand corner on this slide that stands for Relational Sequencing TB Data Platform. And this figure is meant to provide information in part on who has stood up as part of the leadership team for the development of Resec TB. But it in no way represents all of the contributions. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But through funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and grants to the Critical Path Institute and the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics, a lot of work has been done over the past year. You see the additional collaborators that are listed there on the left-hand side that include WHO, CDC, the New Diagnostics Working Group, and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And as Daniela mentioned, the purpose is really to have use by all. That includes clinicians, assay developers, and researchers. So what are the principles and objectives for this initiative? It really stands as a single database, drug resistance database, data repository for mycobacterium tuberculosis. And as part of this development process, there's been a lot of discussion about incorporation of quality control checks and validation procedures to really ensure the highest quality. There's a focus on tiered data access, and as a data contributor, which we hope many of you will become data contributors, you have an opportunity to define what that access will look like. And there's also a heavy focus on making it very easy to use. You see the numbers one through four here, which outline the different tiers in terms of access, something in terms of tier one, which would be limited in scope, all the way to tier four, which be, would be um, having those data that are contributed to be freely available. And again, as defined in the figure here at the bottom, there's a real focus on having this globally sourced, including genotypic, phenotypic, and clinical data when that might be available. So what are the governing principles? The contributing parties, the data contributors, always retain ownership to their own data. We want the database to be accessible. Um, data will re be retained, as you saw in the previous figure, both in its original format and in a standardized curated form. There's a focus on transparency. Data will be accessed only by partners with a documented scientifically relevant purpose and we'll show you on the landing page where there's an opportunity to apply for access where you will have an opportunity to define, define what that scientifically relevant purpose might be. And then documentation. There's a lot of traceability associated with this um, database development process, <coughs> process and then all access, ownership, Copyright and curation work is electronically recorded and captured, including any modifications along the way. So the goal, which has already been mentioned in terms of deliverables, is to really populate the database with a high number of resistant and susceptible isolates, globally representative, so that we have an idea of the global representation of genetic mutations where those um, in certain geographic regions where predominant mutations may reside. We have a lot of understanding for our current drugs. You heard that from uh, Derek's presentation. We know a lot, but there are still things that we can learn. And so we hope as part of this platform deliverable that we will see, um, uh, we may see other things. We may see additional phenotypic test issues. The unknown, rare, or unique SNPs that Derek mentioned. Heteroresistance, which is something that we need to gain a greater understanding of and its impact in terms of clinical outcome and also potentially helping us in defining ECOFs or modifying critical concentrations. It will help us in highlighting and documenting the knowledge gaps. We hope to increase our confidence in terms of the predictive value of polymorphisms for drug resistance. It could be a useful tool for modeling. And there's also a linkage to the fine bio repository. In those instances where a data contributor may want to provide the isolate as well, there could be an opportunity for additional analysis or additional uh, testing to understand things such as the MICs for those uh, specific drugs associated with the polymorphisms. So I mentioned the types of data. The, the focus is primarily at this point on submission of whole genome sequencing data from the Illumina platform. But having said that, there was always, always a recognition that there had been a lot of work over the years done with targeted sequencing. And so there is an opportunity to submit um, data from Sanger sequencing as well as part of this process. But in terms of the unified pipeline that I will talk to you about, it's heavily focused on whole genome sequencing data from the Illumina platform. 
And as I mentioned, they're, they're, uh, all of the incoming data is stored in its original format. There is curation of those and mapping that is deposited into an investigational databases. This um, hopefully will result, part of this process will result in a validation process in terms of looking at the individual SNPs and being able to assign high competence, moderate competence, or confidence that these are not associated with resistance. And at uh, some point in the near future, we'll be seeking a WHO endorsement of that process that will be used to judge those mutations. It's a user-friendly, secure cloud interface. And I mentioned the review and approval process. So I think it's a very exciting opportunity. We've talked about the need to have a high volume of isolate submissions and the need to be able to increase our confidence in the predictive value of these mutations. But another thing that has happened, which I think is equally exciting as part of this development process, is the development of a unified analytic pipeline. It's external to the database, but it's very important in that all of the data that are submitted, the genotypic data that are submitted, are treated in the same way. FASTQ files are submitted, they are run through the unified pipeline, and then in terms of outputs, there are three reports that include a lineage report, an annotated SNP report that includes a listing of all of the SNPs that are um, found as part of that data set, and then a SNP um, report of those that are associated with drug resistance uh, loci, about 40 genes that are examined as part of that particular report. So those are the three things that come out. So that would be something that would be available for data that an individual contributor might submit, and then as each data set is submitted, um, these are accumulated as part of the aggregate output as well. So in terms of that unified pipeline that I mentioned, it validates that the FASTQ format was submitted. There's trimming that's done to remove low quality reads. There's a species specificity check to ensure that greater than 90% of those reads are mycobacterium tuberculosis. There's a mapping quality report and additional quality indicators include um, a high degree of coverage of the genome for the whole genome sequencing data, a minimum read depth of at least 10X, and then variant calling in generation of the reports that I mentioned. So there's an opportunity here. Um, oftentimes, sequencing is not the limiting factor. It's the bioinformatics capacity and the analysis. And so that's been part of the incorporation in the development of resect tb is to have as part of the availability this external unified pipeline. So this is the website. Um, you see the address listed there on the upper left-hand side, platform.resectb.org. If you go to this web website, you will see some additional information, and you will also see here the blue box that says submit an application. If you click on that, you'll be taken to a page which will define the terms of reference for use of the data, things related to citation, um, uh, a little bit of information about what can be done with the data. And then you'll also be asked for your personal, some personal information, it's a very brief application, and you'll also have an opportunity to define your intended use in terms of the scientifically relevant question. Those will be reviewed by a data access team, and then you would receive a username and password, which would be here on the upper right-hand side where you would enter those to access data. And keep in mind, we do have tiered access, and depending on how the data contributor has defined those tiered access would, would dictate what specific information you would have access to. But all data will be incorporated into an aggregate output. So here you see that, um, at least with this particular screenshot, we only have two XDRs as part of the, the data set. That is increasing. Um, at the current time, I believe we have a commitment of about 8,000 isolates. 5,000 of those are in hand, and they are continually being run through the quality checks and the unified pipeline for deposit into the Resect TB database. So these numbers are going to increase. But having said that, we are looking for more data contributors. I think many of us have made that appeal today. And so I hope that you will consider um, coming alongside and joining as part of this collaborative process. Additionally, um, certain metrics in terms of isolates collected over time, the major lineages, and the global representativeness will be included as well on that landing page. So in terms of the time frame, um, a lot of work has been uh, done over the past year in terms of requirements and design, test development. I mentioned the ongoing process to populate the database. We need your assistance with that. Um, the first version of Resect TB went live in October. There will be enhancements. I'm hopeful that one of the enhancements will be, in the future, will be a clinical use utility to really um, provide very user-friendly 
an easy output for use by laboratorians and clinicians in helping us to understand the association of genetic polymorphisms with resistance. Um, the hope is to have the platform available to external researchers in October of next year, and then obviously a focus on in the sustainability, the long-term sustainability of this platform. So in summary, the Resec TV platform, it's more than a database. I think there's an opportunity here as a community to really aggregate these data um, to help us to understand the genetic basis. I mentioned the standardized unified pipeline. It's a great opportunity to be able to have that as part of this database development process. And I mentioned the linkage, hopefully, to a WHO endorsed SNP validation process. The hope would be at some frequency to be able to publish a listing of those mutations that have very high confidence um, from data derived from this database. And then it applies the current versions of bioinformatic tools, and I've listed a couple of publications there that recently came uh, out about the database. And I wanted to mention quickly, if you want more information in the back of the room, um, this information has been printed, thank you, Alessandra, and provided if you would like additional information. And if you are interested in becoming a data contributor, there's contact information on the back. Um, so please take one of these today and let us know if you have any additional questions. In terms of acknowledgments, I've mentioned the partners, but I would be remiss if I, d if I did not mention the contribution of a number of global experts. Um, one of the really wonderful aspects of this as well has been the collaborative nature that has included individuals from across the globe to contribute their vast knowledge to not only the, the design, but the functionality as well. And so we thank you for that. And then finally, just to thank those that have already contributed data as part of Resec TB and to encourage others to do the same. So thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. And now we are moving to Stefan Niemann, a friend, a great scientist. And Stefan is going to talk about the user-friendly platforms for large data analysis. Do you Stefan? have a pointer here? <laughs> Do you have a pointer? Okay, so I'm trying to sh present you a glimpse of what we have available for making all these technologies that you have already heard about usable for people that don't have a big bioinformatic knowledge. So are there tools that actually, once we, one, once we know which mutation makes resistant, is enabling um, normal microbiologist or clinical microbiologist to use those sequencing data and get a result with a comprehensive um, or very easy to use uh, pipeline. So the vision is clear that has been outlined that actually we think from the genome-based analysis we can get as much information as we would like to have um, that leads from species identification over drug resistance polymorphism but also I think uh, genotyping, uh, phylogeny, and transmission analysis is quite important. That will not be covered right now. The obstacle for that, or th the way how we do that, is actually that we look into the genome and uh, in a normal laboratory, I mean, not looking to Oxford, maybe, or other centers that have huge machines, or even not, we can go to decentralized systems by using these smaller benchtop machines that are not much larger than, an, than a PCR machine and could be integrated in a normal laboratory workflow. So that is enabling, in principle, a lot of people to use the technology. This goes in hand with very easy to use library preparation technologies. So it's not only that the machine is comparably easy to use, you could also come from very low amounts of DNA, like one nanogram, you have your kit, you basically go more or less easily into the sequencing, and the trick is actually the readout of the relevant information. So the obstacle, of course, is that the machines do not generate you the genome. They generate you short reads that actually have to be somehow sorted and analyzed. And the classical way to, to do that is actually that we map those reads to a reference um, genome 
So usually to, for the right interpretation, the first obstacle is of course you have to use the right reference genome. If you use the wrong one, you get nice data, but it's presumably not necessarily interpretable. And then all these small reads are somehow ordered to the reference genome, you find variants, you then basically get finally a variant table and this variant table needs to be interpreted in the way that you do find um, those mutations that are conferring resistances. That is usually done by pipelines like this, so it's actually a set of different software tools that are all freely available, so in principle you can of course use these software tools, however, you actually need to link them somehow in a pipeline that is usually running on Linux and is linked by script so that you can imp imp import your fastq files and you basically get out the variants. You also have a number of software tools that you could actually use for interpreting those data but it's actually not very straightforward and you need people like uh, my colleague Viola Schleusener, who is a mathematician and is actually implementing those pipelines in our institute. So you can, so these tools are all freely available, so it's not that you could not use that, but putting that together is quite challenging. If you want to do that by yourself, you also need some core computer infrastructure that is usually maybe not necessarily there, so you have to actually look for some servers where you can run your analysis with decent power and more importantly you also need storage. Storage is, is, is actually enough, you need enough space to put your data away um, for the, the primary data but also the analyzed data and that could really lead to larger requirements. So actually we have in-house right now something like what, 200 terabyte storage that is mirrored on another 200 terabyte um, drive for security. So the question is, I mean, how can you do that easily? And um, also you can do that in the right way. So overall you have a number of constraints when you work with sequencing data. The data generation is getting more or, more or less standardized. Although we don't actually know at the moment how good really the sequencing works in different laboratories when you sequence one strain 20 times in different laboratories, would you get the same result? But there are some issues like um, coverage, um, reproducibility that have not yet been addressed, but with the current chemistry, we think that at least on Illumina, that is nice. A lot of, or there are a lot of um, issues related to the mapping and the SNP readout. So actually the way you organize your pipeline the reference genome, the filter criteria, but also the reporting files, there's a lot of variability that make actually normally data sets from different laboratories virtually not comparable. Still no pointer, right? No. And then a major obstacle is of course the data interpretation. That is basically, um, we would li also like to have somehow a nomenclature, so we would like to have what is envisioned by Reset TB or by others, we would like to have a somehow a database for all these mutations. We also need tools for data exchange and finally the interpretation. So the, here are dedicated software tools available now and I would like to mention three um, tools that I would like to elaborate a bit on. So actually there are tools published, QuarQ, Firus is developed by our group, QuarQ developed by Sebastian and there's a publication that coming out is Microbe Predictor, I think today. Derek, no? Next week. next week. Okay, sorry, I could not even mention it here. So it will come out next week, Microbe Predictor. There is actually, you can download it uh, under GitHub. So this will be published in Nature Communication next week. So these are software tools that actually provide you all the things I have presented to you in one pipeline and we have started two weeks ago to make a bit of comparison of all. I also, we also made ni nice videos to show you how easy it is. However, I realized that I only have uh, 15 minutes presentation time so we, I skipped the videos. The next few slides should only show you 
that you can use those software tools because in the table here you can actually see that we found, we, we generated data with all of these. It's actually something how we could install it and it runs. Um, Firus actually is a web-based tool, but it just should show you that there are differences in what you can expect to get out of it. And basically, um, the, f the first thing I want to mention here is if the pipeline is used. So it's actually that there are tools that use mapping, like BWA mapping, Firus is a web-based tool that uses mapping, realignment, recalibration, so very stringent tools for the SNP prediction and the cleaning of the data. QuarkQ is using a camera-based approach and microbe predictor use a, a brute force um, mapping tool called Stempy. However, it's not really um, no cleaning up and no filtering and no recalibration of the analyzer. The important to one important thing is, is batch mode possible? Batch mode means you can not only analyze one sequence, you can more. And this is possible virtually with all the tools um, or you with mi uh, micro predictor only with some modification under Linux. So it, it requires a bit more of, of computer knowledge. And wh when it comes to the antibiotics genes looked at, then there is of course a qualitative difference. And um, we just added PZA here in the first version of QuarkQ. There was no PZA, no there is PZA, but PZA is for example missing in micro predictor. So when you use those softwares, of course then you will not get um, a result here. It's also difference what you need to have. So um, Pyrus is web-based. The other tools are installed on the local computer. Or Zoo, I really must say, Microbe Predictor, for example, is a very nice tool with a very nice interface. It's really running nicely. Um, there are also differences in the detection of mixed populations and mixed infections. So. Um, Firus is reporting that I think very nicely. QuarkQ is also reporting that the same for micro predictor, but the outputs are quite different. Um, there's also a difference in the in the report you get, what we think plain language report. I mean, we could discuss with the developers a bit if they s agree with our basically uh, consideration for. Firas, of course, we aimed very much to have a nice plain language report so you get a clear-cut resistant prediction output. That is not really true for QuarkQ. I mean, honestly, it is a bit difficult. It's not difficult, but it's not really plain language. Micro predictor makes a, a nice plain language report. There's, there are also differences in the data export tools. So what can you get out of the softwares? So Firus, for example, allows you to export all your variant tables, so you can actually export the full analysis to do it, uh, to use it for other software tools. That is possible also for QuarkQ, but not for, bio, for micro predictor. So that shows you that there are differences using those software tools. And we have then, just last week, started to do comparative analysis with a reference strain set of 92 strains 44 susceptible, 48 resistant, where all the resistant genes were sequenced by Zenger. So we knew very exactly what, w w um, how the results should look like. And this is a very complicated table, and this is also not very much validated right now. So we're actually looking into the results. Um, I just want to point out some things. So actually what you would like to have is actually something that you know in CAD-G by Zenger sequencing, you have 26 variants in the gene and you, your software, easy to use software, should also find 26 variants. So that's actually what you would like to have. And Firus is doing that. However, the, the other software is not necessarily because they do not really report all mutations in a gene found. They only um, look at certain positions, and, and there are some differences here. So we, we, you can discuss if this, if this is relevant or not, but you just need to know when you use such software tools that you don't get necessarily the same answer. There, when you look at RQB here, there, there is actually one phenomenon that was actually even 
showing that the sequencing tools, the next generation sequencing tools, can get a better result than Zenger sequencing because of the fact that both both virus and microbe predictor actually detected one call with a heteroresistance call. So here you can easily see that the result is 19%, and I think. susceptible and resistance allele, so that was nice. And you could e even see it in the Zenger sequencing um, ferrogram if you would look quite um, narrowly. But normally you would not be able to see that there. So there is a potential with next generation sequencing to see those mixed um, populations in strains more easily. And that is, of course, an advantage when you do the diagnostics. There was a strange finding that um, Micro predictor did seven false positive calls with very low frequency. This is something we are currently looking in. If this is a real phenomenon or not, what is actually ongoing there? And there's a lot of differences in the, in the lower part where you actually see here, for example, EMB um, prediction works nicely with virus, so we did find all the mutations found by Zenger. However, there's a large discrepancy with the other tools, and this is something I don't want to mention too much because that comes out of the box last week, so we have to look into those, into the reasons for, for this, um, why this is so, and similarly, when you look for other genetic regions, you have similar phenomena, and for paracinamide, for example, that's a particular problem also that the tools are not necessarily giving you the right answer. And um, we think that actually virus has an uh, advantage that it not only reports you known resistant variants, so you actually get a report also on all other variants found in those genes. So therefore, it's, it's of course, it should find all variants, and it's doing that nicely. So in conclusion, there, there are easy to use software tools available and especially micro predictor, for example, is a tool that runs on your laptop nicely. So it's really easy and it's, it's, it runs um, beautifully. However, the output of the tools are variable. So you, you need to know the, uh, the specifications and I think, so we will extend the evaluation, comparative evaluation of those tools to see where are the advantages and disadvantages and where you can actually tune those tools towards a comparable output. However, they, they really have the capacity to um, bring NGS available to a larger community of people. And virus is most comprehensive. However, we also must admit that as it's running on our server, it's, it's um, slower than the, the other software. So if somebody wants to fund that in a larger server, we would be highly uh, welcome to, to do that in collaboration to develop that further. It also allows the ex exportation of variant table and it also allows tree-based analysis that you can actually do, do similarity analysis if you have a batch mode batch mode uploaded. Okay, I have to thank a lot of people, especially um, the team from the bioinformatics group, so Viola Schleusener, who actually worked on virus and also did the um, comparative evaluation of the different tools, and of course, a lot of collaboration, collaborators and um, the funders, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Stefan. And uh, now it's time for questions for all the speakers. So can I come, all the three of you, to come up? So you can be handling your question and the discussion. Sure. And just raise your hand. There's a microphone here. Just come up to it. Or there's also a wandering microphone if people are, are stuck in their seats. Gary Cangelosi at the University of Washington. And my question um, maybe will apply to um, any other speakers or all of us. Um, the soteriologic cause of both Ellen Zenga and Gail Carr concerned the integrity of the, uh, the data that's being submitted to the university. And so um, the validity factor might be the integrity of the, of the clinical data that Ellen Zenga is showing us up here. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I know that's somewhat different than John, but for somebody who's an expert, what's the other way? 
That's a very good question. Um, I, I know it's one that the expert panels have spent a lot of time considering. Uh, as you mentioned, it was very easy, to, well not easy, but easier I guess to put together some of the considerations for the genotypic data. I think some of the hope is just through volume, you know, to have enough submissions that if we can get upwards of 100,000 submissions to a database, maybe we can overcome some of those limitations. But obviously it can be an issue. As part of the data submission, um, there is a recording of the methodology that's used, and so there would be ability, hopefully at some point, to be able to stratify, to be able to, to look at different methodologies as comparators. But you bring up a very good issue um, that, that requires consideration. I don't know if you all want to add anything additional to that. I mean, <laughs> so you, you, it's, it's depending on the antibiotic you, you, you look at. I think for some antibiotics it's straightforward, for others not. It's depending on the laboratory. It's evolution over time. I mean, we are, we are using retrospective data sets, so you actually, there are some data sets based on Löwenstein, Jensen stands, some on old Bactec, Midget 460 data, and obviously there is variability. So that's clear. Can I just add to what you, what people have said is that if you have some degree of uncertainty between the genomic predictions and what you see phenotypically, that's a problem. Can you get greater precision around it? And one of the ways to navigate towards that is to repeat because there are labeling problems. There are all kinds of problems with submissions. So th if there is the capability to go back and repeat and and clarify, you will get greater precision and gain power in being able to answer those questions. And I think we've built that into some of the work that we're doing. Be because in some situations, there'll be a few examples where there's very valuable information and you may lose it without doing that. I think there's sort of a, a thinking behind it. Is there a question in the, from the back of the room? No. I, um, maybe just in follow-up, I have maybe a, not what's a naive question about uh, PZA, and I'm really looking towards how do we use this data to inform the next generation of drug susceptibility tests and how those tests get validated and used clinically. And my question, Derek, you showed in that histogram of the frequency of, of the different variants and their correlation with phenotypic data. For PZA, there's the distressing problem of a very large number of low-frequency variants, but all of which so far seem to correlate perfectly with phenotypic resistance. And the question is, when do we have enough data to know that that correlation is strong? And what advice do we give to the, the, the groups developing the next generation of tests about which variants need to be included and where that cutoff gets you know, established? How do we know what to include, especially for PZA, which may soon become a more important drug? So you go for the Achilles heel, the weak point. Okay. <laughs> so to get statistical support, you need to see it more than once, definitely, probably around about, I don't know, what we worked out yesterday, five to ten times, you need to get sufficient support. So therefore, for that setting, you need a different power than you might do for rifampicin or quinolone. It's quite clear, just looking at those histograms. And you just have to go on and on and on. So that's one thing. The statistical prediction is diluted because pyrazinamide testing, I've learned from you guys, is, is fuzzy, it lacks precision, it's not precise. So you've got the fact that it looks like a, a large number of loci across the gene can confer resistance, one, you have a poor DST, and therefore w to get sufficient power to have confidence in your testing st statistical power, you're just gonna have to go on and on and on and on. And so 100,000 may not be enough in that si situation, you might have to go up into many hundreds of thousand, that then imposes on the community the task to get DST, to deposit data, and have the means to go on analyzing it way into the future, because with time, you're gonna get increased certainty about the variance. So it's, it's, a, it's really a challenge to the audience as much as anything else, to be committed to deposit data and put the best quality DST that you can. Kathleen? 
I, I would just add one thing. I think with pyrocyanamide we are actually much, much further because there have been dedicated studies exactly to that with qualitative DST and combined with vein tests and that is actually presumably cannot be disclosed right now but it's showing very good correlation with DST results when you do that. Hi, I'm Kathleen England and I'm from <coughs> Challenge TV um, with Fan TV TV Foundation. Um, I was just at the course at Dan Rather's um, uh, Institute and I learned a lot from Susan and your, and your teachers. And one of the things that I think that's it's great to see because I think there's even more beyond just looking at these target dates and stations. I think the variation that we can get and learn from this is going to even lead to understanding compensatory mutations that will arise due to drug pressure. And these are not things we will pick up from mutations that we know. So this is a very valuable um, uh, effort and we can learn a lot more about these uh, adaptive responses and things like that. So if you want to comment more on that, I think that would be great. Yeah, this is integrated, I think, in, in, both, uh, in both activities is actually that, of course, I mean, in a research questions are actually those evolutionary events and clonality of certain strain, MDR strains in certain areas that have adopted to higher transmissibility because of certain mutations. This is a question that, of course, you would also find when you do GVAS. So those mutations are presumably also being detected and is, of course, a quite interesting point there that we can use whole genome sequencing for that. I mean, for clinical diagnostics, that it's with the question if this can be used, but there, there are also hypotheses that um, you, when you detect um, compensatory mutations as a surrogate marker for resistance, that this might be equally useful as detecting the original resistance conferring mutations because those are, as are predictive for a resistance phenotype while the resistance conferring mutations might be more scattered around. So there are actually thoughts for some antibiotics that it might be wise to include compensatory mutations in those assays. Um, would you like to comment on the need to have global representation of the strains as well? In terms of, you know, maybe th that th the real need to have a large representation of all the clones that are circulating and how that can reflect uh, on the resistant phenotype. I mean, we know in association with the genotype. We know for a long time that if you go in different geographical regions, the distribution of resistance mutations is different. So that can, can be due to different mechanisms of resistance spread and immersion. So if you have a lot of transmission, the, the pattern of resistance mutation is presumably shifting towards a certain end of mutations. If you have more acquisition during therapy still in the region, then you have quite other kind of mutations in that region. So you would actually need to have these data sets in there. And another possibility is that different strain types are like more likely to get different mutations and this is something you would also like to have. And furthermore, for classification of the mutations, we use a tool that is called homoplasy. So it's when a mutation is occurring in two, di two different geographical regions or two different um, strain populations, then it's rather likely that this is basically conferring resistance. So there are different reasons for that. And you also can use the data, of course, to look for resistance levels in different regions to, to predict the performance of assays in different regions when you actually know which mutations are there. You can actually simulate the performance of a particular assay because you know which strain types are there. Is that it? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I would just add to that. I mean, I tried to make that plea during the, the presentation about Reset TV, and I know others have as well, um, to reiterate that the value and, of this tool and the power and strength of it is only as good as those data submissions. And so we really do need to ensure that it's as globally representative as it can be for the reasons that uh, Stefan just outlined. 
Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to go to this point. Hi, this is Boris from Park. I think for us it was not necessarily an, um, to recommend or endorse a particular platform. It was just a recognition at the current time in terms of those retrospective data sets that might be available that they were primarily generated using an Illumina platform. But you're exactly right. The landscape is changing and, and will change. It always does. That's the one thing we can be assured of. Um, I think for us in terms of Resect TB, it's being aware of those changes and there may be modifications that are needed to the analytic pipeline that was that was discussed. I mean, I think we just have to stay aware of that changing landscape and, and being adaptive enough and flexible enough to be able to receive those different types of data as they become available. Yeah, I think the most important thing is to know what these platforms generate for you. And that is, so the error profiles are presumably quite different and the capability to predict resistance properly might be different. And, and that is actually, I mean, if you use the Minion technology, just as an example, the error rate per base is much higher than, than basically the uh, Illumina m machines. So there, there are actually differences and nobody right now has, has ever done a comparative, real comparative analysis of the performance of different sequencing technologies um, to predict res resistance from sequencing data. And in addition, I mean, if, you, if it comes to mixed populations and you would go to low frequency mutations, then error profiles are quite important. And, and there are difference when, when you compare ion torrent in, in Illumina, definitely there, there are differences in the output, but also in the demands for the input of the DNA, which is just, it, it just needs to be documented so that the people actually use the most relevant pipeline and platforms. Could I just add to, to, to that, what you're asking for is a set of standards one can converge on so you can compare across platforms and have confidence that the outputs are telling you the same thing. And the community's gonna have to do that. They recognize it, but as human beings, all selfish, all squabbling with each other, it never really happens perfectly. And it's a good question. It's gotta be fixed. We actually did, did one ring trial in the European Reference Laboratory net re Network where DNA has sent out to different laboratories to see what the results are, but so far not evaluated. No, I mean, uh, that uh, EL, the ELN network, that is the network of all the reference laboratories in Europe, has been uh, adding for the first time um, the full genome sequencing in as a standard tool, and we are aiming to evaluate the quality of the laboratories that are performing. But to add to your question, I mean, we would like to be um, kind of inclusive because it's also a pity to throw away all the Sanger sequencing that has been done for years. So at the end, we should find a way to evaluate also the role of those sequences that are out there because we really need to include as many, uh, as many sequences and strains as possible. And uh, uh, said so, if there are no other questions, I would like to close the session. Thanks the speakers, and also thanks the, or the, the sponsor for this coffee break that have been the Queergen and the Beckton Dickinson. So uh, thanks to them, uh, we will be able to offer you the coffee break today. Thank you very much. And thank you.